this is such an important topic. Um, and uh, Cheryl J., I'm just going to abbreviate your last name there. Cheryl J., I, I want to go to you first because um, you lost your son to, to suicide. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Alex passed away on August 12th, 2017. Um, he started showing signs of depression and anxiety in high school and we got him help and he did great graduated from high school went off to college but in his junior year of college um, his symptoms came back with a vengeance and he wasn't in an environment where anybody was addressing it his friends thought they were adults and they were supposed to handle things on their own a little bit of a miss um, direction that we often get with our kids um, and by the time he called us to say he was in trouble he was in pretty bad shape. And we brought him home, but we were constantly chasing the disease. We had a hard time, even though we had insurance and resources, we had a hard time accessing care, big delays. And um, he went and bought street drugs to self-medicate and um, died from a fentanyl overdose. Yeah. I have a, a, a dear friend of mine who uh, her uh, brother was dealing with some mental health issues. And it was really hard for them to get him care. Uh, I mean, they, they tried as, as, as much as they possibly could. And, uh, they, there would be long wait times. And finally, when they got in, like it, it felt like every time, uh, if they weren't going to the exact same doctor, every time they had to kind of start over. Yeah. Yeah. That continuity of care. I mean, it, at Hearts for Minds as our organization, we, operate on the principle that no one should lose a loved one simply because they don't have information or access. And so that's what we focus on in the community. You're in a crisis. Your whole family shouldn't also be in a crisis because you don't have care. And we would never do that with any other diseases. Yeah. Elizabeth, as a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, when you see families going through, uh, you know, when, when, when someone comes with a mental health crisis. Um, how, how do you think it's best for families to support that person? Well, I think we have to be mindful that we're all human and we all have emotions. And so if we can normalize being human and talking about how we feel and what we think, it might feel less like a crisis when something, someone is having intense emotions. And I appreciate so much that Cheryl speaks to this as an illness because we do need to normalize that depression is a medical illness with a neurobiological wiring that we can treat. And what's really cool is the treatment that shows the most effective outcomes is therapy. And so imagine if as humans we felt connected to ourselves and others just through talking, that might normalize even going to therapy. And of course there are medications and other forms of treatment. But when working with children and families, what my approach is and what the evidence shows is if we can restore connection of someone to themselves and their attachment figures, their parents or primary caregivers, we can reduce the risk of them taking their own life. And um, so that's what I'm very passionate about. That's why I teach because I want all healthcare providers to feel equipped to ask the hard questions and to sit for the answers. You don't need to know what to do right away, but if you can be a compassionate listener and connect someone with resources, you can walk them towards others who might have those more um, robust treatment skills. Yeah. When I think about uh, mental health and suicide prevention, uh, one of the things that you know, comes to mind for me is just the stigma around it all. Um, we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to say, you know, hey, I'm struggling. And I think, um, and I also think that like when, when we see uh, like a celebrity or, or somebody in public uh, having a mental health crisis, a lot of times the uh, the conversation, like if you go to the blogs or Twitter or or, or on Instagram, uh, you know, kind of mocks and makes fun of. Uh, I I remember when uh, Britney Spears was going through her mental health crisis and she shaved all her hair off mm -hmm. and like the the memes, the jokes, and all of that. Like it was just funny for people, um, and I I think that just adds to the stigma. Um, and just in, in uh, trying to d 
dispel and fight that stigma. I just want to say that like I struggle from depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been good for a bit, but like there have been times when I've I've been in a really dark place. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that got me out of it was uh, well, at, at one point um, I, I I went on mex- medication um, to kind of help me through it. And also like I have a great therapist who I talk to all the time. Um, well, not all the time, but a lot. <laughs> and then, uh, so, um, so yeah, I, th- I think that like that stigma uh, is a big part of, of, of what holds people back from getting help mm-hmm. and also what holds families back from, from being able to wrap their heads around how to tackle these things. Well, and I do think it's scary as a family um, to say, please take care of my child or, or to allow a medical provider into such a vulnerable place. Yeah. And it's normalized when we think about asthma. If somebody's having an asthma attack as a parent, you're going to hand them their inhaler. Yep. Mental health and mental illness should be the same, where we should want to incorporate those who are trained to support our families. And, and Cheryl, think, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, please. I was just going to say that, you know, I think there's oftentimes shame associated mm-hmm. with living with mental illness. And so it's really important that we create gracious spaces for people to come mm-hmm. and to share what their struggles are. And so uh, with Voices Institute in collaboration with the Partnership for Child Health, we've been creating these spaces for young people because a lot of times we think about adults, but it's also children, it's teens, it's, it's across the life um, continuum. And so we've recently conducted listening sessions with youth across the city, over 75 youth, and they told us what their stressors were. Academic stressors, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. family problems, balancing work, life, and school, racial identity, gender identity. Uh, These are some of the things that our young people are struggling with, and they don't always know where to go. And so our goal is to inform and to uh, make sure that they know that they can call the 988 number, that they can connect to uh, mental health resources here so that they can be whole and well. Yeah, I I just, as you say that, like I'm I'm having a flashback to being uh, in middle school. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's cool. Right? (laughs) It's rough, right? The worst. Yeah. And I remember uh, things that were actually pretty small. Mm. Now I can look at them and say that they were pretty small, but they were tremendously big as as a middle schooler uh Mm -hmm. to the point where like i i thought uh that you know the world was going to end because i had done something that i shouldn't have done yeah and i didn't know who to talk to and it just felt completely overwhelming i i I did not have suicide suicide ideation at all i'm just saying that like my problems felt so big uh because i was so small and trying to understand this crazy world um, Cheryl, you're, you're, Cheryl Dees, you're on the phone. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your experience and your son? Absolutely. Um, we lost DJ to suicide, um, June 14th of 2018. Um, DJ was a, an excellent student, superb athlete, 4.0 GPA, um, was getting ready to go to a private boarding school and we had no idea at that time that he suffered from severe anxiety. Um, DJ was a perfectionist, always willing to help someone, absolutely kind, gentle soul. Um, And just going back to what you just said, what we try to do at DJ's Marvelous Light Foundation is break the stigma, especially in the African-American community, by getting people to talk about it, to know that it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to be ashamed. Um, And to go back to what you just said about, you know, middle schoolers, even children who are in elementary school, You know, when you are surrounded by individuals all the time and you make one mistake in the age of social media now, you know, like I said, back in my day, you make a mistake, only a few people might have known about it. But now with the age of social media, someone could be videoing it, taking a picture of it, and one click, um, millions of people could see it all of a sudden. So what we try to do is we tell DJ's story, you know, about trusting the process, get out, talk to someone. When, you know, students or when children come to their parents or come to a teacher or come to a guidance counselor, create that safe space for them and also let them know it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to be ashamed of it. If you encounter an individual or a student who has suicidal ideations or someone who's contemplating, it's okay. We have to be able to get them the resources and the coping mechanisms that they need to make it through, the therapy that they need to make it through, the resources to them to make it through. I think that's great. Just to tie it back to something you said is 
I think we have to crowd out that stigma that happens with the memes on the social media that people mm -hmm. are just inundated with, crowded out with the unapologetic conversations because the stigma is also a self-stigmatization. The people going through it are self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. They're stigmatizing themselves because they're looking from their perspective out. People are making fun of people with issues. So I think it's really important what Cheryl's doing with DJ's mm -hmm. memory um, to change that. You can join the conversation at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. First Coast Connect at WJCT.org. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. You know all the places. Just reach out. Uh, Lindsay, you work with uh, wounded warriors, and uh, suicide is just a, a horrible thing in general. But when it comes to our veterans, it, it's... I, I looked at some of the numbers recently and it's shocking to me. And mm -hmm. it feels like uh, it is a national failure mm -hmm. that, that like, you know, I mean, obviously suicide prevention um, it, for everybody, we, everybody, but it, it feels like with our wounded warriors, people that have put their lives on the line uh, for us overseas, um, that they just get forgotten. And it, it's, I don't know. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when we think of suicide prevention, we know that any given time in the United States, something like one in 20 people are thinking about suicide. Mm -hmm. um, our most recent annual warrior survey showed more than one in four of our warriors in the past year were thinking about mm -hmm. suicide. And to kind of paint the picture even further of those who said yes, 72% said the thoughts had been as recent as the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when we think of our veteran communities, there are some risk factors that make them a bit more vulnerable. Um, when we think of high exposure to trauma, that transition period out of the military, losing their sense of purpose, their connection to their community, um, all of those things exacerbate, you know, challenges related to mental health. Um, you know, I think at Wounded Warrior Project, we're really working so that all of our programs and services address known risk factors risk factors, mental health being our largest programmatic investment, but also things related to financial services, right? Ensuring that they have the benefits that they deserve, ensuring they have access to employment if that's something that they're interested and able to do, getting connected to a new community, um, and being active again, so really addressing multiple issues related to, to suicide. We're going to go to the phones. We've got uh, Linnell in Mandarin. Linnell, are you there this morning? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, first off, just real quick, as a retired Navy veteran, I do want to say thanks for the information that you're putting out um, for our veterans. Um, so, but I, I called, um, I had a, one of my siblings recently um, committed suicide. Um, she was a long-term care provider for an elder family member and um, really was just at her wit's end out in a very rural area of Florida. Um, where there's not a lot of options for home health aid or for anything else. And after a while, it's like family and church stopped coming around. Um, so she was really just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, but also the lack of resources out in some of our rural populations. So I, I hope that we can help normalize virtual um, and, and telehealth uh, type of mental health resources available for folks, especially those who can't get out and maybe those who don't have mental health care facilities in and around where they live. Linnell, thank you so much for calling in. Cheryl? Sure. Linnell, I, we agree at Hearts for Minds that that's, access to resources is a huge issue, and it becomes more complicated in the rural areas. We are working on some initiatives with some community alliance programs to expand um, access to resources in our more rural areas. We're expanding in Nassau, Clay, Putnam, um, and some of the additional counties. So it's a really good point, and we appreciate that, and we're working on developing that partner list so that people in those areas have equal access to resources. Yeah, and I'll also just jump in for, for veterans in particular. Wounded Warrior Project has um, a vast number of community partners that we work with, many of whom are able to offer telehealth, and we work to ensure that there is that kind of military cultural competency available um, so if anybody is interested, they can reach out to Wounded Warrior Project at 888-997-2586 to get connected to some of those supports and resources. Um, and I would just speak to the pediatric population. So if you're not aware, um, Wolfson Children's Hospital does also have a local 24-7 crisis line um, that you can call. And they do offer telehealth services for 
many of the mental health um, offerings. And then also you have health. We have a pediatric psychiatric team there. So um, depending on access and availability, there are um, local larger systems that are trying to address those needs and offer um, the video platform. What you mentioned about culturally responsive care is so important because we know that uh, historically the white population has died by suicide, but we've been seeing an increase, a major increase in suicide in the black community. And so um, it's important that clinicians understand the impacts of racial stress and trauma. Uh, we just had the Dollar General incident that happened in our community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, having clinicians that understand, you know, how that affects your uh, view of yourself, your sense of self-efficacy, what that means in terms of, you know, your value, your worth as a citizen mm -hmm. in, in this United States of America uh, is important because uh, those issues are connected to our health and well-being. It's uh, a really good point. Cheryl, uh, Dees, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I just wanted to expound on what Dr. Bass just said. You know, suicide amongst black youth in the United States is growing at an alarming rate. Um, we do know that from 2018 to 2021, the African-American community had the largest increase in suicides with children as well as young adults from the age of 10 to 24. Um, so, again, just breaking the stigma, getting resources out there, letting people know it's okay to talk about it. There should not be a sense of shame or a sense of feeling, you know, discouraged about um, someone having a mental illness. We always say everyone has mental health. Everyone might not have a mental illness, but everyone has mental health that they need to care for. We got a, a, a comment from Junior on Twitter. He said, uh, depression and suicide definitely need attention in society. As an African-American member of the LGBTQ plus community who grew up with uh, obesity, depression and contemplating suicide were part of my life for a long time. Junior, I, I, I just want to say to you that you're valued and you're loved and we need your voice. Um, and, and, you know, I, I understand a little bit about depression, how like depression lies to you and tells you all these things that are not true. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to, especially when you're isolated and you don't have anybody else that's helping, you know, fight those voices off, but you, you have to like hold on to the thing that like, you know, this too shall pass. And if you keep pushing through and keep, uh, you know, rem reminding yourself how amazing you are, you get through it. I, I don't want to like make it, you know, all Pollyanna and say like your struggles aren't real. Your struggles are absolutely real. It's just that the voices uh, or, or, and the feelings that depression can give you are not. Yes, and I am so grateful for you sharing that comment, and I'm also grateful that you're still here because I think what the data shows and what we need to remember is most individuals who do attempt to tank their life and survive are very grateful that they wake up and they are able to repurpose some of that lying from depression and use it in a way to not only heal for themselves but also to benefit others. And we have to be mindful that we are all so desperately human. We have brains and our brains have this phenomenal way of feeling, but sometimes our limbic system can get a little too loud. Yeah. And, and we need those rational thoughts and we need these conversations to pull us out of the limbic system and back into those bigger thinking parts of our brain. You can join the conversation at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. You can email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. You know where to find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, all the places. Just hit us up. Um, one thing I think about a lot is uh, the loss when when someone uh, does suicide, um, when someone kills himself. Um, I have a, a, a dear friend of mine who passed away many years ago, um, and he killed himself. And uh, just the uh, the the black hole it leaves in your heart, the way it like just sucks everything. Uh, it's so hard to move past. And, and you know, I, I'm constantly thinking about his parents um, where, like, I was his friend. I was his good friend. But, like, uh, you know, the idea of, of going through that as a parent. So there are a lot of statistics. We'll talk statistics and I can talk the parent side. Cheryl Dees and I can probably have hours worth of conversation about what it does as a parent. But statistically, when someone dies by suicide, the direct impact that puts other people at risk is 
about 12 people directly will now be at risk for having suicidal ideation because of the helplessness you feel. And you can work those statistics through. So for every person who has died by suicide, and we talked about those statistics earlier, there are about 150 people who are impacted by that suicide and then become at different levels of risk. So it is a community and society Mm -hmm. issue. It isn't just that a single person should speak up and talk about what they're feeling, which they should do. We should get in front of it. But the impact on our community, if anyone thinks it doesn't affect us all, is mistaken. Mm -hmm. As a mom, it was the most devastating thing I think I will ever go through. Alex was my oldest child. He was sweet and kind and delightful that's why at hearts for minds we use this dragonfly as our symbol because we have a picture of him where one landed on his face it was the way to remember him it was about changing the face of mental illness just like dj no one would have known we had a diagnosis early but if he was walking on the street it's not as if he had a sign on him that said i'm mentally ill so um yeah we have to start to crowd that out by for me as a mom kind of Crowding out that little black hole is about working in the community and helping other people. I don't know that it'll ever go away, but we try and give it a little less space. Yeah, and I, if I can for just a second, I think this is where training becomes really important. And I think a couple of you have hit on this important point. You know, we really have to take more of a public health approach because we know access to care is a challenge. And most of these conversations aren't starting with mental health professionals. They're starting with our friends and our youth workers and people that we're seeing every day. And, you know, we at Wounded Warrior Project have really tried to use the training that we have available through an organization called Living Works to provide training to not only our staff, but to our warriors, to our community providers, to local law enforcement, so that people know how to ask the question and sit with them, right, to provide that space. We don't have to fix things. We don't have a solution. Time and distance is the life-saving combination. And if we can teach people to have that conversation, it really does save lives. We're going to go to the phones. We've got uh, Kathy in Orange Park. Kathy, good morning. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Good. What you got for me? Well, I'm a little concerned about the fact that um, I am a, a mother of an addicted child, okay? And uh, just the cost of getting mental health and putting them in some of these facilities that we have, which I'm not saying anything bad about um, some of the facilities because I know that they're overrun, but I want to know why we just don't have certain uh, mental health um, on every corner of (laughs) every street because people are dying. Mm. You know, and it's not just because of suicide. It's because they're just not getting the mental help that they need. I know it's an overpowering phenomena, but we just really need to start trying to concentrate on getting the funds to start putting mental health on every corner. Kathy, thanks so much for your question. I'm going to give it to the panel. I I love that sentiment. Um, wouldn't it be beautiful if we did have mental health advocacy and um, people available that we felt comfortable speaking with on every corner? What a beautiful concept. And um, for your family, living with someone with addiction, um, I have a lot of compassion. And I would like to let you know that we do have a local nonprofit called Here Tomorrow. So um, that is an organization that you can reach out to. Anyone could reach out to. If you are looking for a peer to connect with or other trained individuals, that could also connect you with local providers. And you're right. The healthcare system is broken. And we have to talk about that. We have to talk about that. Reimbursement is not equitable for mental health care. We have to talk about the delays. We have to talk about the lack of education in um Our communities and when I when I say communities I mean all communities and you know around this table we all represent different communities and so we've got to do better um, locally and nationally and that community sentiment is super important I mean the education piece it is educating the community we offer what's called QPR training it's suicide prevention training and we talk to groups about 
you're your own little micro community. So if we can, it's the concept of am I my brother's keeper, right? If we can educate the community on suicide prevention and how to recognize it and have a conversation, we'll start to chip away at it while we're trying to fix the mental health care ecosystem. Yeah, and again, from from the veteran space, all of the programs and services that we offer at Wounded Warrior Project are, are available at no cost for our post-11 veterans who are eligible to be alumni and even for some of our other era veterans through our Warrior Care Network program. But I would also just remind any of the veterans who might be listening of the newly passed Compact Act, right? If you are experiencing a suicide crisis, any facility who offers care um, inpatient can can provide that treatment to you at no cost. Um, there are some limitations in terms of if you've been dishonorably discharged, but by and large, um, that care is available at no cost. And if you need a ride to the facility, right, call 911, that emergency uh, EMS arrival ambulance ride will not cost you anything either. And yes, yeah, so we just produced a video, a teen suicide prevention video called Give Healing a Chance. And it was in partnership with Cheryl Dees and her foundation. And you can go to the Partnership for Child Health website to see that video, as well as to access local and national uh, community resources. I just want to highlight that one of the things that um, young people said in terms of what they need in order to feel supported is um, visibility and validation, mm -hmm. visibility and validation that they need to be seen and they need to be heard. Uh, one of the you've said to us that, you know, it's an opportunity for, for parents, you know, to uh, learn something new every day about their child. So that engagement, that connection mm -hmm. is so important in terms of helping our children to be whole and well. So, And I love that that came from children. It's beautiful. We're going to take a break. Uh, I have a caller on the line, Yvonne. Yvonne, hold on. We're going to get to you. We just need to take a break. Uh, so we're going to take a break now, and we're going to come right back with my caller, Yvonne. Good morning. You are listening to First Coast Connect. I'm Al Letson. I've got an amazing panel with me today. We are talking about suicide prevention. You can join the conversation. Call us at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. You can email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all the places. You know where to hit us up. We want to hear from you. On the line, I've got uh, Yvonne from the South Side. Yvonne, how are you doing this morning? great this morning. Thank you for having me on. Yes, please. I just wanted to say that people in the medical profession are not immune to stigmatizing patients who mention mental health. They will ask you about mental health, but it's been my experience that once you speak to having depression and or anxiety, your well, the way that you're viewed can change at the practice that you're going to see, how you're viewed by other medical people there, and uh, whether your physical concerns are taken seriously or not, in particular saying that you have anxiety, uh, you can kind of get categorized. And I think people need to be more aware in the healing professions. You're um, absolutely right. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. 
um, we're working with Baptists to change how they manage mental health care, um, and they're being a huge innovative driver in the community. Um, we installed what we call a Dragonfly Care Coordinator that helps to instill more compassion for that journey. Um, and it is a long journey. It's a little bit of a war of attrition versus um, a quick fix. But the community is trying to work on that, and we are sorry um, that you had had that experience. Yvonne, thanks so much for calling. We're going to keep uh, the conversation going. Um, Yvonne, you are absolutely correct. And as a mental health provider, I never wanted to go into mental health. When I first went into healthcare, I wanted to work in the ER. My first job was actually at the VA in Gainesville. And working with veterans opened my eyes to the human experience and that sometimes providers would just walk away from the bedside. And then I would be a nurse standing in the room and I didn't know what to do or say. Um, and I would ask questions. Well, who talks to someone about this or how do I support this person? And I found out that maybe I could become someone that could support people. And I would just like to propose that if we took the stance as humans that we're all doing the best that we can with the resources that we have, if we could approach each other with compassion, including healthcare professionals, please, if you're listening, be mindful that not all healthcare professionals received mental health education like we're talking about now. But I do know there are initiatives within many of our local systems that are trying to address that. And uh, we're all doing the best that we can with the resources that we have. As a reminder, we've got uh, Cheryl Johnson, founder and president, uh, president of Hearts and Mi Hearts for Minds, uh, Selena Webb Bass, an author and CEO, founder of the Voices Institute, Elizabeth Winings, family mental health uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner, founder founder of Winings Wellness, and assistant professor of nursing at Jacksonville University, Lindsey Gray, Warrior Care Network senior specialist for Wounded Warrior Project, and Cheryl Dees, executive director and founder of the Darnell Dees Jr. Marvelous Life Foundation. Uh, they're with us today. We are taking your calls. You can call us at uh, 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air, First Coast Connect, the WJCT.org, and Facebook. Um, as we are talking about, like, different communities, uh, wounded warriors, uh, African-American community. I think one community that we haven't talked enough about is the LGBTQIA community. And I know that um, we did a, a, a segment a couple months ago, I, I believe, uh, that kind of uh, talked a little bit about like uh, suicide prevention in the LGBTQIA community. And I can't tell you how many emails and comments I got from that community telling me that like it's a problem and we should talk more about it. Um, how do we reach out better to that community? Uh, and, and, and a lot of the comments that I got were from um, adult members of, of the LGBTQIA uh, plus community uh, who are advocating for the younger members of the community who, who feel um, where we are politically, that they are being, um, targeted and excluded and uh and that leads to a lot of these feelings that we're talking about so i think we have to i mean it's education and understanding and compassion i mean we all were in middle school i think we all probably can agree it's a rough time i think you compound that when someone feels different or is struggling to understand their own identity they're often ostracized at school or kicked out of their home. And so we're adding a lot of trauma now at the current political environment that are using that community in a way that is causing more. So it's a lot about empathy and compassion and education in the community. Educating our community and bringing us together is a key piece of this puzzle. And until we do it, we're always going to be managing things at a crisis. Mm -hmm. And we do have an amazing local organization called Jasmine. So if you are a parent of a child um, that is in this community, or if you are an individual in this community, that is an organization that we have locally, and that is spelled J-A-S-M-Y-N. And you can go to their website, jasmine.org, for additional resources. There's also jacksyouthequality.org that has lists of resources for other groups. And so if you are in the LGBTQIA um, group, 
or community or if you are connected with someone and you're not sure how to best support them, you can reach out. And the last resource I'd love to share is at Carithers. Um, we do have Dr. Sanchez, who is a local expert on this area. So if you're a medical provider or a family who's looking for a resource, he's a great one that we have locally. I'll and just... Yeah, so during our listening sessions, this issue came up. Uh, we think about intersectionality, right? And so not only is race and being a part of uh, a historically marginalized community, being black, being brown, but also uh, sexual identity, sexual identity in terms of gender orientation and expression um, also came up as well. And think about a young people who, a young person who may be uh, of color, a person who may be identify with the LGBTQ community, and also poor. So you know, when you have all of these layers, it can really weigh, and the heaviness is there uh, for young people. And so again, it's important that we connect them to resources and connect them to people who offer uh, unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to share one other resource available. Um, it's called the Trevor Project, yes. which is a national resource. So you can call the 24-7 hotline regardless of where you're at in the community. And they are um, geared very specifically towards LGBTQIA youth in particular. And we do have a local crisis text line if someone needs a text connection. Um, if it's not a crisis, if it's a crisis, uh, you ought to call 988. But it's text LIFE. 741 741 and there are trained providers there to help and they respond I think that's the most important thing to know is that there are real people on the other line and uh, these resources work we know that they reduce the risks of um, crisis and we're going to go to the phone we've got uh, Anna in Jacksonville Anna how are you caller are you there hello hello okay wait is someone there all right. And we're going to keep, oh, let's see. Hold on. My phones are being a little bit funky today. Let's try this one. Anna, are you there? I am. Hi. How are you this morning? I am great. Thank you. How about yourself? Good, good, good. What you got for me? There is a certification that trying to, like my 90-second elevator pitch, there was a grant that we had in Jacksonville. I'm a nurse. Um, it was supported and, and processed through, I think, St. B's, Mayo, and Baptist all got together. Um, I'm not sure if it's still active, but it was free to the community. It's nationally recognized. It was supported by Michelle Obama. She's got a video on it. Lady Gaga's got a video on it. Um, the Comedy Central trying to normalize the training aspect so that people don't hesitate. They know if somebody says they have a crushing chest pain or they can't feel half their face or a massive headache, they recognize those symptoms and they know what to do. And mental health first aid is a certified basically I, I tell people liken it to CPR for mental health crisis nobody expects you to come out of it to be a therapist or prescriber or diagnose you're just doing the chest compressions or rescue breaths until the professionals get there but that you know how to notice how to intervene and how to get support that is necessary or not but that there's so much stigma about oh somebody's either acting or I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to make it worse or I don't know what to say or I'm uncomfortable. And it's a fabulous, again, it's national. It's actually international. It started in Australia. Um, certification program since COVID, they've created a new blended version that you can do virtual, um, half of it online. And then you get to practice the skills of intervening with somebody, assessing them appropriately and providing that support. But to let folks know if they really want to feel like you're normalizing the same way life-saving for a physical health issue, people are so commonly familiar with the crisis symptoms of a, a physical health issue and would intervene and do chest compressions. They wouldn't just walk past and tell somebody, hey, make an appointment with your primary. Yes, yes. Anna, thank you so much for your comment and your call. There's mental health first aid training, and there's also QPR training. It's called Question, Persuade, Refer, which is specifically suicide prevention. Um, we offer free QPR training. If people want to go to our website at hearts4minds.org, you can sign up. But you can also search for mental health first aid training online. Um, some of them are free, um, and you can sign up when you're there. And there's an adult and youth version of mental health first aid So, uh, for, for both populations. And we're going to go to the phones again. We've got Les on the west side. Les, how are you doing this morning? Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a uh, licensed clinical social worker, and I spent 22 years on the uh, psych floor at a major hospital here. 
And I just recently retired. But I, I just wanted to offer my apologies for some of the callers that have called in expressing that the providers uh, were very apathetic. And I, I would offer to them that a, a lot of the problems uh, resulting in apathy by the providers is due to the just the, they can't do anything due to the laws. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of laws that exist, and just listening to your show, there's a tremendous amount of education that is just not provided to people unless you're uh, in that circle, uh, like the Marshman Act. Many people are familiar with it, but some are not, and it's the only mechanism to court order people into some type of treatment. Les, so thank you. Marsh, yes, Les, thank you so much for your call. We really appreciate the comments. We got to wrap up today, but I just wanted to thank my panel for coming in. Cheryl Johnson, Selena Webster Bass, uh, Elizabeth Winings, uh, uh, Lindsey Gray, uh, and Cheryl Dees on the phone. Thank you all for coming in and talking to me about this important subject. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you for making this space. Yeah. Let's do it again. Uh, we will do it again. And meet us at Ed White at 10 o'clock on Thursday for our Youth Mental Health Summit. All right.